welcome to Francis Burt Chambers. Um, we're delighted to be hosting this event today. My name is Alex Mossop. I'm a barrister here and also a member of the Criminal Lawyers Association, a committee member, um, who are co-hosting this event. Um, I'm going to shortly hand over to the speakers who, will be, who are the authors of the Transforming Legal Understandings of Intimate Partner Violence Report. And they will tell you a bit about themselves and then tell you a bit about um, their findings. After each of them have spoken, there'll be some time for questions and then broader uh, plenary questions at the end. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Julia Tolmy and I'm Professor of Criminal Law at the University of Auckland. Um, I did spend 10 years at the beginning of my career at the University of Sydney. So I have spent some time in Australia. I think it's fair to say that there is fairly widespread recognition at this point in time that the criminal defences were not originally well designed for the circumstances that victims of intimate partner violence found themselves in. And certainly there have been reforms in most Australian jurisdictions in an attempt to address this issue. Unfortunately, I think we can say that these reforms do not yet appear to have had the effects that they were intended to have. And one of our central arguments in this report um, is to suggest that the problem today is not so much in the law, it's in how we think about the facts that we apply the law to. So today I'm going to describe and contrast two different models for understanding facts involving intimate partner violence. A bad relationship with incidents of violence model and the social entrapment model. I'm going to use a recent Western Australian murder trial, um, State of Western Australia against Liana Gay, to show how using a social entrapment paradigm allows us to see a larger and more accurate picture of facts involving intimate partner violence. In doing so, I'm going to focus on how the law of self-defence operates in relation to women who have been abused and who use lethal force against the person abusing them. Now, self-defence, of course, as most people in this room know, provides a complete acquittal in respect of a person's use of violence. So basically we, in other words, society, say that if someone is attacking you and you're cornered, then you're justified in fighting back. You're not obliged to allow yourself to simply be hurt or killed. Of course, intimate partner homicides where women have been abused by their partner kill him are relatively rare. When women do have a history of being abused by their partners, they're almost three times more likely to be killed by than to kill him. And hence the title to this talk, when there is an intimate partner homicide, most women are being buried. They haven't survived in order to be tried in a court of law. So what is the main paradigm that we use within the criminal justice system to think about um, intimate partner violence? I would call this a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm. And I would suggest that this is a theory that we use to think about intimate partner violence when we're not even aware that we're using a theory. We think we're using common sense. It represents an amalgam of two things that we know about or that we think we know about, um, dysfunctional adult relationships and crimes, which are essentially defined as acts of interpersonal violence. So the paradigm has these following features, which I have up on this slide. The parties are in a dysfunctional relationship. Both have to take some responsibility for that. One partner, sometimes both, have engaged in acts of physical violence. In between those acts of physical violence, the victim isn't being abused. The victim has a number of effective safety options, leaving the relationship, getting a protection order or calling the police and they're free to exercise those safety options when they are not being abused. But instead of exercising those safety options, the victim has instead chosen to tolerate the abuse because of her love for her partner. So why is it a problem to think this way? Well, obviously, uh, as most people in the room are aware, that in order to apply the criminal law, we are always judging the accused actions in the context of their circumstances, because behavior, such as the use of violence, which is unacceptable in most circumstances, may be appropriate in some. And so it follows that if the paradigm we're using to understand circumstances involving intimate partner violence is wrong, then that's going to affect the criminal justice response both to people using violence and people offending in response to 
um, been victimised. And I would suggest that a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm is producing a number of injustices in our criminal justice system today. I would say it affects victims' abilities to access a range of criminal defences, not just self-defence, but we are focusing on self-defence today, even when they fall within the rationale for having the defence. It means that we can misread the offending of those using violence and those responding to violence against themselves and their children. And I think it also affects our sentencing responses and the structure of our sentencing principles. So basically the ramifications of what we talk about in this report, even though we focus on self-defence, I would suggest are much bigger for our criminal justice response. But turning to look at self-defence. So of course, the test for self-defence in Western Australia is contained in section 248, subsection 4 of the Western Australian Criminal Code, um, which is set up uh, on, the, on the overhead here. And I just want to point out, it's important to note, that the legislature has expressly made it clear that the defendant, the harm that the defendant is defending themselves against does not need to be imminent. Um, that's part of the package of reforms I was talking about earlier to, to try and adapt the defences, the criminal defences, to uh, victims of intimate partner violence. Now, of course, every jurisdiction that has self-defence, um, which is most jurisdictions that we would, we would look to, formulates the test slightly differently. But I think when it comes down to it, however the legal test is formulated, the normative question that we are asking is whether what the defendant did was reasonable in self-defence in the circumstances. That is the essence of self-defence. Um, and it follows that there are two central factual qu questions to be answered, because those, how you answer those questions depends on whether or not what the defendant did was reasonable. These are what was the nature of the threat she faced and what means did she have to deal with that threat. Now, if you use a bad relationship with incidents of violence theory to understand the intimate partner violence that a victim is responding to, then I would suggest that you cannot understand her defensive actions as reasonable unless she is actually being physically attacked at the time or just about to be physically attacked. And the reason why is that at least unless she is under attack, the theory presupposes that she has effective safety options that she can access. And what this means is that women who are victims of intimate partner violence can only argue self-defence if they've taken their violent male partner on in hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is what Justice Bertha Wilson in the Canadian Supreme Court 29 years ago said was tantamount to sentencing abused women to murder by instalment. It's a little bit more problematic than that because even if a woman attempts to defend herself when she is under attack, if you're using this paradigm to understand the facts, it's difficult not to see her as partially responsible for choosing to allow things to get to that point. In other words, choosing to wait until she is attacked before she defends herself, rather than exercising her effective safety options before things get to that point. So what we have done in the last couple of decades is started to introduce expert psychological or psychiatric testimony on battered woman syndrome in support of a victim self-defence case. So this evidence was initially introduced in order to challenge the idea that it's reasonable to expect women who are in a, victims of serious intimate partner violence to leave the relationship. And so battered woman syndrome theory has these features. It understands the violence is taking place in three stages. So there's what's called the tension building stage, then the acute battering stage, and then what some people call the loving contrite stage, what some people call the honeymoon stage, where there are promises it won't happen again. And the theory is that the violence goes in this cycle. And then having survived the cycle several times, the victim develops trauma which causes her to psychologically bond with the person using violence. Or some people say develop learned helplessness. There are different theories of how it works. So that she can't leave him despite the abuse. 
But when you think about this paradigm, it's basically a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm with the victim's mental health issues added in. So the approach still involves understanding the abuse in terms of the incidents of physical violence in between which the victim is assumed to be free to exercise her effective safety options, but she chooses not to do so because she has mental health issues as a result of the abuse. So it follows that the key difference between these two paradigms is that under a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm, we blame her for not making rational safety options. Under this paradigm, we would excuse her for not making those safety options. In other words, a jury that relies on this testimony um, might want to ameliorate the criminal justice responses, response to her, but it would be unlikely to acquit her on the basis that she acted in reasonable self-defense. So the most likely outcome of using this kind of evidence is that if she's charged with murder, she's likely to be convicted of manslaughter. And that's what happens in the overwhelming majority of these cases. So what am I saying? I'm saying that if these theories are used to understand and frame the facts of these cases, then they automatically provide readings of those facts that prepackage the victim's actions as unreasonable defensive force. Um, and that's problematic for a number of reasons. One is that neither paradigm has support in the recent research literature into the nature of intimate partner violence. Certainly not in respect of those cases that escalate to homicide. Um, and another problematic uh, feature of this is that we are supposed to, when we apply the law of self-defense, to be judging the circumstances that the defendant was in from the perspective of how things look to her. Of course, she has to have reasonable grounds in Western Australia for that perspective, but it's supposed to be from her perspective. Um, and of course, we have legislation, we have the reform in Western Australia, which makes it clear that she should be able to argue self-defence when she's facing non-imminent harm. But as I've explained, the paradigm automatically makes self-defence not available in those circumstances, so it undercuts um, the law. And the final problematic thing, of course, is that it's up to the prosecution to disprove self-defence beyond reasonable doubt. In other words, if there's any plausible case for self-defence, then the defendant is entitled to the benefit of it. It's not up to her to prove that her actions were reasonable in self-defence. Um, she's assumed to be innocent until she's proven guilty. So I'm going to turn to use the facts of Western Australia against Lena Gay to illustrate what I mean. So this was a case where in June 2014, Dr. Shamari Lena Gay used a heavy object to inflict several blows on her husband, Nendra, while he was lying in their bed. Those blows killed him and she was charged with his murder. The jury rejected her self-defense case. She was convicted of manslaughter and sentenced to four years. So why use this as a test case? Um, it is a case which is fairly typical in terms of the nature and seriousness of the violence, the stories that were told about the facts, and the criminal justice outcome. I don't have time to run through all the stories that were told about the facts in this particular case um, by the different professionals involved, um, so I'm going to just focus on the prosecution. Um, I do want to make it very clear that the point um, that we've made in this report and what we're talking about tonight is not a point about individual professionals getting it wrong. So I'm not pointing the finger at individual people. It's about the paradigms of thought that we are all inculcated in and have to challenge in ourselves. Like myself that's been 30 years working in this field. So, Shamri's ac account of her relationship with Janendra was limited to the following narrative and how the prosecution framed its case against her. The marriage between Shamri and Danendra was unhappy. There were some acts of violence by Danendra, but no physical violence for several weeks prior to the killing because he was getting his own way, which meant that the physical levels of violence weren't escalating at all. If Shamari was afraid of Danendra, she, could have, she had other options. She could have left him or called the police. 
Instead, she chose to stay with him. Um, in other words, she chose to tolerate the abuse because she loved him. And she killed him because of frustration and possessive jealousy. He was going to leave her to pursue a relationship with a 17-year-old. Now, if you think you have recognised a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm, then you are right. But I want to say a little bit more about what this paradigm means for these two central factual issues. What was the nature of the threat she faced and what means did she have uh, for dealing with it? So, starting with the nature of the threat she faced. When you use this paradigm, you are automatically limiting the nature of the threat that the victim was facing to any acts of physical violence and only for so long as they are happening. So in other words, if Shamari is compliant with her husband's demands in order to avoid being attacked, then using this analysis, she's not been abused in that moment. But there was something else that's interesting about the way the prosecution constructed its case um, here, which I think is something that, that has some bigger lessons for us to learn. Um, the prosecution suggested that Shamari had exaggerated the physical violence. And he did this by saying that the evidence she provided about the violence in the relationship was scant and lacked detail. Now, one of the unusual features of this case was that Shamri provided detailed evidence about the sexual abuse that she had been subject to. This is often a very hidden part of intimate partner violence for obvious reasons. So, she described being raped on camera in front of strangers. She described being raped whilst being forced to watch videos of women and children being violated being hit aggressively if she tried to turn her head away. She described being anally raped. And she described this as sexual torture. I don't want to confuse consent with sexual arousal, but I do want to make the point, um, which I think we can sometimes overlook, that women's bodies prepare for penetrative vaginal sexual intercourse as much as men's do. So that forcible vaginal penetration without arousal is not sex in the absence of some kind of contractual consent. It's a physical assault on a tender part of the body. But when you look at the prosecutor's account, you can see that Denendra's sexual violence is characterised in terms that suggest that it's more in the nature of bad sex than violence. In other words, sex, at worst, minus some kind of contractual consent process, but still sex. So she's described as engaging in sexual practices that were unusual and which she did not like, um, and so on. And I think that Denendra's sexual violence was seen so obviously in the category of bad sex rather than violence to the prosecutor, which may have been one of the reasons why he was able to say that the evidence of violence was scant and lacked detail. But I think this is a bigger problem. It's a bigger problem in terms of how we talk and think about sexual violence and the language that we have to do so. Um, because the experts and the judges in this case did the same thing. So I'll just point to the Court of Appeals characterization of the description of being raped while being forced to watch children and women being raped and violated. The deceased forced the appellant to watch child pornography, sometimes whilst having sex with him. So the second thing I want to mention is, um, the second central factual question is, what were the other safety options that Shamari had available to her? Remembering that it's up to the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that she had other means of achieving safety, because that's central to proving that her action was unreasonable in the circumstances, and it's the prosecution's job to disprove self-defense. But the prosecution in this case devoted days of testimony, including a bevy of experts and professionals, to a minute analysis of the crime scene. So we had um, the position of the body, we had the configuration of blood spatter, DNA analysis, fingerprint analysis, forensic analysis of the computers, um, different professionals' impressions of attending the scene, 
there was not one single piece of testimony proffered to establish that calling the police or leaving the relationship were effective safety options for Sharmarie in her particular circumstances. Um, we could have called police officers who were experienced in responding to intimate partner violence to testify what they could realistically provide Sharmari and her family in Sri Lanka who were also under threat had she engaged with their services. And I think that this demonstrates that a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm has a kind of truth power in its assertion. Not only did the prosecution call no evidence in support of a, a simple assertion that the victim had safety options, but no other professional in the case commented on their failure to do so. And I think it's one of the problems when you're trying to challenge a paradigm like this at trial in trial, is that the challenge that you're making to the paradigm is heard by decision makers who are thinking through the paradigm and may not even hear the challenge. Okay, so it's unsurprising that Shamari was denied self-defense by the jury. What I want to do now is turn to talk a little bit about what we should be doing instead. So the New Zealand Family Violence Death Review Committee has suggested that we should be analysing intimate partner violence as a form of social entrapment which requires that we analyse three dimensions of the facts. So the first tier focuses on the specific raft of abuse strategies used by the predominant aggressor. But it's important to note that these are understood as being much broader than just the acts of physical violence for so long as they're taking place. Um, and we're also asked, and, and they're different in nature as well, we're asked to look at the impact on the victim over time. The second tier asks us to realistically look at rather than simply assume the safety options that were available to the victim. The third tier is not really a tier because it folds into the other two, it's just asking us to look um, expressly at the manner in which structural inequities exacerbate the predominant aggressor's ability to coercively control the victim and weaken the safety responses of those around her who might otherwise be in a position to help. So for example, if she's got no money, no car, no credit on her phone, dependent children and she's living in a rural area where she's surrounded by his family who all have status in the community, then that's really significant to understand. So in this particular case, in Shamari's case, this would require looking at the Sri Lankan cultural norms around marriage and gender roles, the experience of immigration and the experience of being a racialised woman in white rural Australia. So I'm going to turn now to very briefly, and I'm just scrambling through this, um, but we have the report available if people would like to uh, have more detail. I'm going to turn to analyse the facts of Liana Gay from a social entrapment perspective, focusing on the first two dimensions just for reasons of time. So starting with Denendra's coercive and controlling tactics and their impact on Shamari. So this tier of social entrapment draws on the work of Professor Ivan Stark, who published his groundbreaking book in 2007. Now, of course, there was a long um, history of research literature that he was drawing on and decades of clinical practice um, as well in writing this book. And he suggested that intimate partner violence is not an assault crime. In other words, it's not about the physical violence per se. It is an attack on the victim's personhood. It's a raft of abuse strategies developed by trial and error over time by the person who knows her most intimately that are directed at undermining the victim's independence and closing down her space for action. So in this case, over time, the way the abuse worked was that Shamari began to restrict her own behavior to try and manage Denendra's because she was exhausted and terrified by it. And the result is that she began to put her own personhood aside on a moment by moment basis to become tuned into his wishes. And I think that's encapsulated in this quote from her testimony. When he's ready to eat, it's ready. When he wants to go out, I'm ready. When he wants to watch movies, I'm doing. When he talks, I'm listening. <clears throat> 
And I will make the point that doesn't mean that at this point she's not still resisting the abuse, but she's at the point where she can no longer afford the high costs of overtly resisting the abuse. So on this understanding, the nature of the abuse is strategic and retaliatory. It is directed at closing down independence. It's directed at closing down the victim's personhood. And when you understand this, it makes it possible to see that the threat posed by the predominant aggressor is bound up with the options the victim has for dealing with it. Because the abuse is directed at punishing and thwarting any resistance including any help seeking on the victim's part. I think it's really important as well, or it's acknowledged by Stark, the importance of acknowledging the victim's resistance. Uh, that's important because it exposes the full extent and nature of the violence which is being used because it's exposing what the abuse is directed at closing down. Um, and it also gives the victim some dignity She's not understood as passively allowing this to happen to her. Um, so this, in, in this particular case, for example, Shamari had resisted Denendra's abuse from the beginning of her relationship with him. Although, as I have pointed out, over time the resistance became more covert as she could no longer afford the costs of overt resistance. And so these are some of her many acts of resistance in the period of, that period of time. But you can compare this to the previous two paradigms where the abuse is understood solely in terms of the physical violence is seen as occurring independently of anything the victim does. So for example, if you're adopting a battered woman syndrome paradigm, um, we're seeing the abuse is taking place in a cycle, like the weather or the seasons. And so when you look at how the experts in this case using a battered woman syndrome paradigm characterised Shamari, you can see that her resistance is completely invisible. Another important thing to notice about this analysis is that it highlights the manner in which abuse tactics utilise the norms of heterosexual sexual intimacy, including the norms of love, sexual desire, marriage, and gender roles. And to begin with, the abuse strategies may even look like expressions of romantic love. Um, so in this particular case, there was a high level of surveillance. Shamari was obliged to account for her movements. For example, called an angel when she left work and stay on the phone while she traveled home. But that was initially presented to her as being about her safety. In other words, a gesture of protective concern by her male partner. So when you understand that, then proving that the victim loved the person using violence against her on this analysis is not the equivalent of proving that she was not being abused because the norms of marriage and heterosexual sexual intimacy are the vehicle for the abuse. In contrast that with the prosecutor in this case who kept asking Shamari over and over again as though if she loved him, as if, if she said yes, which she did repeatedly, he was proving that she was not being abused. So I want to turn to say a little bit more about the particular abuse strategies um, as described by Ivan Stark. Um, and Stark divides these strategies into two categories, indirect control strategies and direct tactics of coercion. So indirect control strategies include isolation of the victim, deprivation, exploitation and micro-regulation. And these are about undermining her independence, fostering dependence on the um, person using violence. And then direct tactics of coercion, uh, uh, overtly forcing her um, to comply. So I'm just going to race through these, but I think it's important to be aware of how they work. So starting with tactics of isolation. So Shamari met Denendra in 2009 in Sri Lanka. They, they were both training to be doctors. And in, over the next five years, he essentially severed her intimate connections with those around her so that her predominant intimate relationship was with him. And there are a series of behaviours. I'm not going to go into the details of them. Um, 
a series of behaviours that achieved that. I think one of the very significant things was persuading her to join him in Australia, where she left behind her family and her original community, um, and then insisting that she only socialise with him. It's obvious what the point of isolation is. You are removing anyone who would provide the victim with an alternative reality check, anyone she could reach out to for help and support in a situation, anyone who might intervene to challenge his behaviours. So the next set of behaviours, um, depriving her of basic survival resources, uh, for example money, um, exploiting her for personal gain and regulating her behaviours to conform to stereotypical gender roles in the minutia of everyday living. The point of these tactics, as Stark points out, is not to actually achieve a particular outcome, such as a clean house or a particular meal, it's to root out a woman's independence and to condition her to obey his authority without regard to its substance. And the way it works is that compliance might mean physical safety for her, but since the rules are constantly being revised and reinterpreted, it's impossible for her to satisfy him. So she's in a state of constant anxiety. Turning to the direct tactics of coercion, Stark says that abusers resort to violence in order to establish the high cost of resistance and to create a level of fear that disables the victim's will to resist. And he points out, I think this is really significant, that most physical violence in coercive relationships is chronic low-level violence that has a cumulative intensity for the victim. In his words, the single most important characteristic of woman battering is that the victim is bearing the weight of multiple harms. And each event is interpreted by her in the light of what she knows about what he is capable of based on what he has done in the past. So in this particular case, it was not until Shamari was isolated from her family and her culture in Australia that Denendra began to use physical violence. Um, and his violence from the very beginning was instrumental. It was directed at getting her to do what he wanted or to punish her for resisting or trying to be independent. Um, so he first used violence to force her to be a sexual commodity that he could swap on the internet for pornography that he wished to access and then to force her to look happy while that was happening. Uh, he used violence against her when she refused to assist him in making contact with vulnerable young women or girls whom he wished to have sex with. Um, there was one experience of terrifying violence in 2012 she was on the phone to Denendra walking home from work when she stopped to talk to a female client in the street in breach of his instructions not to talk to anyone. So he came to meet her and he physically felled her um, in the street. And when they got home, he attacked her again. So she screamed for help and fought back, but he overpowered her and hit her so hard that she was left unable to breathe. And so that experience communicated to her that she could not physically uh, resist him. And in fact, that could exacerbate uh, the violence. From mid-2013, his beatings became frequent. He was using weapons such as wooden spoons, plates, chairs, boots. He kept the rolling pin in the bedroom in case it was needed. He ordered a catapult through tiny metal walls and she would have to stand naked while he used it on her. He told her the violence was because she was not learning to do it as he required. I've already described the sexual torture that Shamari was subject to. By 2014, she described the violence as constant and herself as exhausted. It reached the point where it was enough for him to give her a look and she would do as he wanted. So just briefly mentioning the final um, direct tactics of coercion, intimidation. Uh, these compose three types of behaviours, threats, um, surveillance, so she's always been watched, um, and degradation, which denies her self-respect. It's also an isolating factor because even when the victim reaches out for help, she cannot fully disclose the horror of the situation that she's in. Um, in this particular th um, instance, the threats which were really salient for Shamari were the threats to her family uh, back in Sri Lanka. So here's a woman in a really frightening situation. She is subject to sexual torture, She's living in constant expectation of painful punishment if she doesn't manage to please her partner. 
This has gone on for years. She's exhausted and overwhelmed. She knows she can't physically uh, fight, defend herself against him. And he's in the process of manipulating a 17-year-old so he can have sex with her. And Sharmari's options are both intolerable. She can either be complicit in a child's violation or she can experience violent retaliation if she doesn't assist. She's under his constant surveillance. He's now moving into her workspace, so that's been her place of safety. She's a competent and well-regarded doctor. And he's removing her independent means of transport. What were those around her able to do for her? This is the second tier of an entrapment analysis. Starting with the community response. So people in Sharmari's community did know what was happening. She'd made disclosures to several people in Sri Lanka, but on each occasion, Denendra's authority to use violence against her if she displeased him was validated. So in fact, the wrong that occurred in 2012 when she was attacked um, in the street was seen by her family, the wrong was seen by his family as her screaming when she was attacked so that she could get him into trouble with the police. Um, and making him angry uh, to begin with. A number of people in Sharmari's professional community in Australia had noticed something was amiss. She had made partial disclosures to several people. For various reasons, these people were not able to take action um, in response. What about the agency responses? Now, obviously, Denendra had committed serious crimes against Sharmari under the Western Australian Criminal Code. But she testified that if she reported these crimes to authorities, she and her family would be in more danger. She said if she contacted the police, Denendra would be interviewed and would simply deny the allegations. Because most people were under the impression that they were a happy couple, she was unlikely to be believed. So prosecutions were unlikely to take place. And having alerted Denendra to the fact that she had disclosed the abuse to authorities, she was then likely to be left alone to deal with his retaliation. And even if she survived the immediate fallout from reporting his behaviour to the police and whatever happened to him in consequence of a criminal justice process, she would be in fear for the rest of her life about what he would do to her and her family. Now you might say, well, she honestly believed that, but it wasn't reasonable. She should have contacted the police. But here's the thing, her assessments of what might happen to her are supported by reports from multiple government authorities and other bodies from multiple jurisdictions. So for example, the Western Australian Law Commission and the Ombudsman's Office have documented the limitations of the police response to intimate partner violence. Um, including survivors' accounts of contacting the police and finding the police generally unsupportive or unwilling to take action failing to investigate offences that have occurred on the basis that it's your word against his. But even if the responses by agencies are exactly as they should be, our current repertoire of responses may not be effective for women who are dealing with a dangerous intimate partner violence offender. Um, the New Zealand Family Violence Death Review Committee has mapped the uh, family violence safety system um, in New Zealand, I looked for a similar mapping in Western Australia, I couldn't find it. I don't imagine, uh, apart from differences in details, minor details, that it's too different. Um, the New Zealand Family Violence Death Review Committee said that it's not really a family violence safety system other than by default. It's a collection of fragmented responses which are designed to deal with things other than family violence, with some underfunded family violence initiatives kind of plonked in. So the safety um, options currently available, getting a protection order, contacting the police to initiate criminal proceedings, going into refuge accommodation, all require victim initiation. So in other words, we're putting responsibility for safety on someone who's likely to be in a state of ongoing trauma. And they generate a one-off reaction that may not address the danger that the victim is in. Remembering that when a victim is dealing with a dangerous intimate partner violence offender, inadequate responses don't simply fail to provide safety. They can significantly escalate the danger that the victim is in because they've put the offender on notice that he needs to close down further help seeking in any enforcement process. Now we often assume that separation from the predominant aggressor is the way we can keep victims can keep themselves safe and we continue to assume that despite the fact that we know that separation is a risk factor 
for intimate partner homicide when women are dealing with dangerous offenders. So the Family Violence Death Review Committee found that two-thirds of female primary victims were killed in the time leading up to or following separation. Um, and I just want to briefly mention um, how separation was treated in this case. So Sharmari um, left Anendra in 2013 and 2014. In both occasions, she did so after asking him to let her leave. In other words, it's clear that she knew that there was no escape unless he chose to relinquish her. And she explained, well, in both occasions he agreed, but on terms which indicate to me that he had absolutely no intention of allowing her to separate. And so she explained this in, in court multiple times. She said, you have not left your abuser if they've had to grant you permission and they've set conditions on your departure that mean you'll be under their surveillance for the rest of your life and making your income available to them. Now that seems pretty obvious, she hadn't left. But she was understood in court as having left, having achieved safety and choosing to return. So the Court of Appeal presented this, these facts under the heading separation and return in 2013. Well, that makes sense if you think under a bad relationship with incidents of violence paradigm, so long as she's not been physically attacked, she's not been abused, and leaving the relationship is assumed to be synonymous with safety. It's assumed to be one of her effective safety options. So what we're suggesting in this report is that the theory of intimate partner violence that we use influences what facts we see as significant, what facts we understand that we need to prove, and the meaning that we make of those facts, and that a social entrapment analysis provides a more complete and accurate picture of those circumstances. And in fact, we argue in this report that a jury could not have fairly concluded beyond reasonable doubt that a victim's actions were unreasonable in self-defense without properly understanding those circumstances. So the challenge here is shifting the way we think about intimate partner violence. And this is the challenge to uh, members of the audience who are part of the criminal justice system, the challenge to prosecutors is, do we always have to prosecute these women? If we analyse the facts and find a cognisable case for self-defence, is it appropriate not to lay charges? The challenge for defence counsel, and I understand that it shouldn't be defence counsel that bear the burden, we need shifts in our collective common sense. But the challenge for defence counsel in the interim is to understand and run defences based on social entrapment and to hold the prosecution to their burden of proof in respect of all the elements of their self-defence case. I've got a couple of tools up here. The New Zealand Family Violence Death Review Committee has developed a set of questions for practitioners to try and tease out social entrapment on a set of any set of facts. And this is a, one of the few cases, the Queen against Barrett, just decided this year from the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, where the court put the Crown to the burden of proof in respect of its self-defence case. So the challenge to judges is to let an expertise on social entrapment to develop criminal justice responses in ways that better reflect the operation and harm of intimate partner violence. And for everyone else in the audience to think differently and convert that into different ways of acting in response to intimate partner violence, whatever you do. So thank you very much. Julia has shown that the predominant model of intimate partner violence applied in the Lena Gay case, um, as an illustration of many other cases, is one of incidents of physical violence overlaid with the psychological responses of the victim model. And that that model is incapable of revealing the nature and therefore the extent of the violence um, that is perpetrated by an intimate partner. And as Julia has also said, it follows from that failure to understand the violence that a person was up against that the law of self-defence can't, in fact, be applied. And I want to look further at that idea that the law of self-defence wasn't actually applied in the case of Western Australia and Leonie Gay because the violence that was the basis of the claim of self-defence was not perceived or was perceived in a blurry and not fully realised way in the state's case against that claim of self-defence. So that's a different idea from the idea that the law of self-defence was applied and the conclusion was wrong. It's the idea that the law wasn't actually applied. <laughs>
In other words, if the violence a person was facing doesn't register in the trial or in the law, we can't apply the law of self-defence because the very basis of self-defence is that a person acted reasonably in the face of violence. So how do we say that this <coughs> happened? Well, before I embark on that question, I want to point out two distinctions or relationships, actually, uh, that are fundamental to, to what I want to say. The first is between the past and the present. I want to look at the old common law to show that some of the assumptions about violence that underpinned that law and which we understand that we jettisoned for ourselves in modern times, in fact still operate implicitly in the application of self-defence. So I'll look at the law according to Blackstone, and for those who aren't lawyers in the room, Blackstone was a foundational common law <coughs> jurist of the 18th century, and his famous works are understood to be um, a collected statement of what the common law was at the time. Looking at the past here, then, is not for the purpose of a history exercise. My purpose of, um, for looking at the past is to gain a perspective because it's often easier to gain a perspective from looking into the past in order to do what is an incredibly <coughs> difficult task of observing our own current, necessarily in many ways invisible to us, cultural practices. So although I'll be talking about Blackstone, this is a current project and it's a difficult project to really see what we're doing now. The second distinction or relationship um, that is a focus of what I'll say is that between usually narrower abhorrent rules, rules or practices or ideas that we would want to distance ourselves from and would certainly never endorse on the one hand, and on the other hand, usually broader positive cultural practices or social ideas that we would never want to let go of, that are precious to us, even cherished ideas. I want to try to show, and this is the point of this distinction, that narrow abhorrent rules can sometimes have their source in the positive loved practices such that if we want to abandon a rule, we sometimes won't be able to do that unless we're prepared to look at our cherished cultural practices. So that is, our positive societal constructs can be linked to things that we would want to be rid of in ways that aren't immediately obvious. So I'll look at the old common law of homicide and of marriage and how it would have been for a wife if she sought to rely on self-defence, if she in fact defended herself against her husband. And then I want to show that some of the same patterns of thinking that we assume we've abandoned are still evident today, and they operated in the Leonie Gay case. So very briefly, a potted account of the old common law. Murder and manslaughter were felonious homicides Murder was distinguished from manslaughter by the concept of malice of forethought or roughly an evil design in the killing of another person. The most odious form of murder, however, was petty treason. As Blackstone said of an earlier time than his own, it was, quote, ranked in the same class with the crimes against the state and the sovereign, end of quote because it was murder committed by an inferior in a status relationship. And those relationships comprise a servant killing a master, a wife killing her husband, or an ecclesiastical person killing his superior. In terms of defences against homicide charges, some homicides were justified in the advancement of public justice. These included killings in, to prevent serious crimes, including attempted robbery, housebreaking or murder, and included defence against rape. A woman killing in defence against rape would have amounted, as a matter of law, to a justifiable homicide. 
Other uh, killings were um, excused, including killings in self-defence or say defendendo. The requirements of that excuse were that it occurred in a sudden affray during a brawl or quarrel by chance medley. Chance medley meant that danger arose suddenly and the killing was without premeditation. The need for, uh, so the need for self-preservation um, arose in a fight, so a fight context, physical violence context. This excuse also required that a person had, where possible, given back. In other words, had run away, quote, as far as he conveniently can to some wall, ditch or other impediment, end of quote, before defensive force would be excused. If he couldn't run away at all because of the ferocity of the, the attack, he could use defensive force straight away. So killing in defence against rape was, a just was justified as a matter of common law and killing in self-defence was excused if the need arose suddenly in a fight and efforts had been made, if possible, to run away. Now the law of marriage. The law of marriage was based on the principle of marital unity. Blackstone wrote this in 1765. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law, that is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband, under whose wing, protection and cover she performs everything, and is therefore called in our law French, or law French femme covert, is said to be covert, barren, or under the protection and influence of her husband, her baron or lord, and her condition during her marriage is called her coverture. This principle of marital unity was the basis of the homicide rule of petty treason, that killing a husband as an as was an inferior killing a superior in the status relationship of marriage. <coughs> Another result or expression of this principle of marital unity was the legal, there was the rape immunity rule. So a husband could not be prosecuted for raping his wife. There was no rule that declared that a husband could rape his wife, but factual rapes of wives couldn't be prosecuted. They didn't sound in law. As a matter of law and logic, this immunity rule arose from the principle of marital unity in this way. On marriage, the parties became one and therefore there was no separate legal entity in a wife who could refuse consent. So the question on which rape turned, the absence of consent, was an impossible concept as between husband and wife. That was the legal logic of the rape immunity rule. And I want to point out here one of the connections that I referred to earlier. The rule that a husband was immune from prosecution for raping his wife, the rape immunity rule, had its source in law's positive constructions of marriage. Who a husband was, who a wife was, within a marriage, within the concept of a marriage, led logically and analytically and socially and legally to the rape immunity rule. And if we take this further, or rather if we describe it in a different way, a cherished social institution based on the idea, on ideas about the immersive union of two souls, bodies, legal entities, led to an immunity from prosecution for rape by one person of another. And as I said, it's that relationship or implicit social logic that I want to emphasise. Some of the rules we'd never want to be associated with are connected with the things that we'd never want to let go of. So what was the effect of the law of marriage on wives' ability to access self-defence if in fact they did defend themselves against their husbands? Well, there were a number of effects, including difficulty for wives because they were less likely to be fighters in a brawl or chance medley context. But I want to focus on one particular effect, a different one. The principle of marital unity 
is going to make self-defence by a wife against her husband really difficult to see. If a husband's role was, in law, to have authority over, to protect, guide, act for, correct his wife, it was going to be difficult immediately to see the distinction between a husband's role, his authority, and violence. And with respect to a wife, it was going to be difficult immediately to, immediately to see the distinction between a person suddenly not acting like a wife and that person acting in self-defence. The distinction between not, not submitting as a wife and acting in self-defence. Sexual violence is the quintessential dimension of this. The rape immunity rule arose from the marital unity principle. If sexual violence by a husband against his wife didn't exist, that is, couldn't be seen in the criminal law, then if a wife did in fact defend herself against forced sex, she was defending herself against conduct that was not cognizable in the law as violence. And there's no self-defence claim unless you're acting against unlawful violence. If the law couldn't see that she was being violated, in other words, she wasn't, it wasn't going to see that she was defending herself against a violation. Um, so, in this sense, it could be said that it was impossible, rather than merely instrumentally difficult, for a wife to rely on self-defence against her husband. But these laws have changed, clearly. Firstly, there's no Australian jurisdiction now that limits the application of self-defence to the fight or chance medley of fray, sudden danger context. It can be employed um, against non-imminent harm, including intimate partner violence. The rape immunity rule has been abolished. A husband can be prosecuted for raping his wife. And the marital unity principle has also been abolished almost entirely. There are remnants of that principle in evidence law, but it's mostly gone. So the law has changed. In the report that we've just published, we look at the Leonage case to show, we suggest, that a number of these principles in the earlier law are still operating, despite law reforms, and making it difficult or impossible still for a self-defence claim based on intimate partner violence to register in the law. And here I've selected one example of what we consider in the report. So through these various principles of the common law, Factual knowledge of sexual violence against wives was prevented from sounding in law. There's no realistic view of history that would say sexual violence against wives was not known of. But there were legal rules in place that prevented the experience and knowledge of that violence from registering or sounding in law. And I want to show that in the Leonage case also, <coughs> factual evidence of sexual violence against Chamri was precluded from sounding in the law. And I should pause here to reiterate something that Julia has said. We've analysed the transcript of this case in great detail, but we're emphatically not concerned with criticising any individual's work. These are squarely problems of cultural understandings and they are the responsibility of all of us. Sexual violence formed a major part of Chamri's non-imminent harm self-defence claim. And as Julia has shown also, Cham Chamri gave detailed evidence about Denendra's sexual conduct, <coughs> both in a record of interview with police and in oral testimony in the trial. Yet despite its presence in the trial as fact, 
the deceased's sexual conduct played little or no part in the legal case against Charmery as sexual violence. And I mean that quite literally. I'll try to show in two ways that in the state's case, Dinendra's sexual conduct didn't register as sexual violence against his wife. I'll look at one passage that's illustrative of a general approach taken by the state in the prosecutor's case, and then at the overarching theories in the case, both, both of the prosecution at trial and in the sentencing court. One of the ways uh, facts of sexual violence were kept out of the state's case was through the state's making its position with respect to the truth, that is the existence of sexual violence, unclear. So although its, it's, case, it's, it's case theory, the, the prosecutor's case theory, which I'll look at directly shortly, squarely rejected the possibility of any sexual violence. The state's position was pre presented at trial, though, largely implicitly, in a number of ways, from rejection of the existence of sexual violence, a partial rejection of the existence of sexual violence, and even, in a few places, acceptance of the existence of sexual violence. It was presented Im by implication, not expressly, and it was unclear. And whether this was done with deliberation or inadvertently has no relevance to the idea that I'm presenting here. The shrouded quality <coughs> of what the state's position is or was in the trial is my focus. And to focus on the one of a few small number of places where the state accepted the existence of sexual violence. This is the illustrative passage, and I'll read it. Dr Leonigay says she was forced to do that, and the reference was to performing sexually in front of Skype cameras. And the evidence is that someone was driving those machines at the time. She says it was the deceased, and the state can't prove it was or it wasn't. The state just doesn't know who was driving the machines, and neither do the experts. You'll remember even the, the, the electronic expert yesterday couldn't say who was behind the account Dean. But you may think, well, if the account is named Dean and it's on a device that is usually operated by Denendra, who was also known as Dean, then it may have been Denendra or was probably Denendra that was driving the device. It's a matter for you. But remember that it's not a... Sorry, there's, he's speaking to the jury. It's a matter for you, but remember that it's not a conclusion that is necessarily beyond doubt, but it's one of those issues which a jury has to deliberate over and apply common sense. And if you come to the conclusion, well, we don't know, the state would say in this regard it probably doesn't matter in relation to the Skype sex chatting because Dr Leanne Gay says she was forced to Skype chat and it's quite possible, if not entirely within the realms of possibility in this case, that that was happening. In this passage, this illustrative passage, the state, in fact, accepts Charmory's evidence of forced sexual conduct. But its acceptance is faint and ambivalent. It's quite possible, if not entirely within the realms of possibility, that it occurred. And its acceptance is obscured by details about a different question that probably doesn't matter that was the question of who was driving the laptops. It was also obscured by invoking a compelling and wonderful criminal law principle that it's the jury's right to decide. It is the jury's right to decide questions of fact, <coughs> but it's not the jury's right to decide what the state's position is about a question of fact. So the first point here is that the state accepted the fact of sexual... Uh, sexual violence in this passage, but obfuscated its acceptance of that fact. So its position was shrouded. But that's not the ultimate point. The ultimate point is this, that that obfuscation, and this is an illustrative passage of the general approach, 
meant that Chamri's basis for her claim of self-defence disappeared. It's only logically at the point of the possibility of sexual violence having occurred that the questions required by a claim of self-defence against sexual violence can begin to be asked and then answered. Obscuring one's position in a, in, in a particular, and in particularly an obscuring of an acceptance of the fact of sexual violence truncates the questions required by law to be answered, asked and answered in self-defence. It's only then, when that um, acceptance has occurred, um, that, the vi that the questions like, was the response reasonable, etc., can be asked or answered. So although this is different from the rape immunity rule per se, it's a similar mechanism which made the fact of sexual violence invisible in plain sight in the trial. The acceptance of the fact of sexual violence against a wife, but then a legal process by which that knowledge is rendered moot in the law. The second way I want to show that evidence of Denendra's sexual conduct played little or no role as violence can be seen in the overarching structures of Chamri's liability in the state's case theory and the sentencing court's sentencing rationale. They were different, but in this respect, they were the same. So first, the state's case theory was that Chamri was jealous of Kay's sexual relationship with her husband. Chamri wanted to keep her marital relationship with Denendra. The state's theory, therefore, was all about Denendra's sexual conduct, both res with respect to Chamri and with respect to others. But the case theory takes no account of that conduct as violence. So the analytical structure of that narrative um, including um, the marital sex with her husband was one that Chamri desperately wanted to keep. She was jealous of Kay and didn't want to lose her marital relationship with Denendra. There's no conceptual room in that narrative for the sexual conduct of her husband towards her to be violence unless Chamri wanted sexual violence and was desperate to keep it. So on a single pivot of motive, the state precluded a construction of Denendra's sexual conduct as sexual violence. Then after the trial, Chamri was sentenced for manslaughter on the basis of a different narrative because it was clear that the jury had rejected the murder verdict, because the jury had rejected the murder verdict it was clear that they had rejected the jealousy narrative. The sentencing construction was that Chamri acted to protect Kay from Denendra, and Kay was the um, girl that Julie has referred to too, who, who Denendra wanted sexually. When sentencing Chamri, the judge wrote this, you had a genuine concern that the deceased wanted to go further and have a, sec have a sexual relationship with the girl. You related to her because what had happened to you as, an, as a naive, albeit much older woman, was something that you saw happening to the girl. You were concerned that he would discard her, having had a sexual relationship with her and destroy her life. This sentencing narrative is just the same as the prosecution's case theory insofar as Denendra's conduct as sexual violence towards Chamri is entirely extruded from it. Denendra's sexual conduct was constructed entirely as marital sex or extramarital sex. This means Chamri's sentencing contained no registration of Denendra's sexual violence towards her, none. And to be clear, this means that Chamri was tried, convicted and punished 
on the basis of legal narratives in which her husband's sexual violence against her played no part at all. Legally speaking, it's as if it never occurred. So this 2016 case is different from the old common law in that Chamri could raise self-defence because non-imminent harm is formally recognised. But it's no different from the old common law in that the evidence of her husband's sexual conduct towards her as sexual violence made no sound in the law of self-defence. This was a similar vanishing act. And then, if evidence of that violence made no sound in the case against her, it necessarily follows that the state didn't disprove Chamery's claim that she acted in self-defence against that sexual violence. So to finish where I started, there are reasons why self-defence is difficult to see as grounds of self-defence. If the violence a person was facing doesn't register in the law because it goes unperceived um, and because there are framings that quarantine it from being part of the lit justice process, then we can't ask, even before we answer, the questions required in the law of self-defence. And I've just um, finished, but I've put on the overhead three um, recent cases that um, <coughs> don't mention Blackstone, but um, talk about the, the way that the law has been structured in these appeal cases is consistent with what I have said about um, the requirements of self-defence. Thanks. I was admitted in 1979 and after 40 years I decided to look up the definition of a lawyer in the Shorter Oxford Dictionary. It's a person with knowledge of the law, a person who knows the law, or a member of the profession of the law. So I'm a member of the profession of the law. In terms of the law itself and knowledge of it, what I've done in my career is each time I get a case, I research the law and look at it very carefully and make sure that um, I um, get to understand it. But in the law of self-defence, that's not an easy job. It's a complicated area especially in relation to the self, uh, defending oneself against non-imminent non harm. So what I've done over the years is I've relied on experts. I'm not an expert, I'm just a lawyer from Gerald. As I've told many judges when they've expressed uh, dismay at uh, me and said you should know better. I'm just a lawyer from Gerald, Your Honour. So in this case uh, of uh, Charmery Linegay, Stella Taram was uh, an amazing help to me, as was Tony Templeman, QC, who um, uh, tutored me on the law and helped me in this case to put the facts to the law because it wasn't easy the way the prosecution was running this case. I mean, as far as they were concerned, the accused was a cunning, conniving, jealous woman, which really didn't make sense because she killed her husband with a hammer uh, at night while he was asleep in the bed. And she was a doctor, he was a drug addict. She could have found lots of good, easy ways to kill him, but just give him a hot shot or something like that. So the idea of a jealous rage uh, didn't make sense. Like a lot of things that were uh, said in that case. Um, Julia has said that the case is typical, and it is in a lot of ways, but in significant areas it is not. It is atypical because there are significant differences between Chamery's case and others that I've been involved with and read about. Domestic violence is still seen as something that happens in low socioeconomic groups. And when an intelligent 
highly educated woman, a doctor, uh, is in a position where she's abused, that's a completely different scenario for um, people to understand. And on the other side of the coin, anyone in that situation, uh, in a small community, um, is reluctant to suffer the shame of having to say, I'm, I get bashed by my husband and I allow this to happen and uh, I haven't left because that's the perception out there and it's a matter of shame. So it's a difficult thing to uh, let people know. The stigma of a woman in that position, in a small community, especially where the man who's doing this, a lot of people at the hospital thought was wonderful and a very charming chap. And you know, these people in the higher um, economic, socio-economic group, they, uh, the, the husband is in the local golf club or he's in the Rotary Club and he's well known around the place. So there were very significant differences in this case to others that I've been involved with and others that I've read about, which makes the case a good vehicle for the production of, in, of um, documents like this for the profession and um, the community at large to show that even someone in that position um, can be trapped, controlled and coerced and have no way to escape. Back in uh, 1989, there was a woman called Jenny Dingo in Carnarvon and uh, she killed her husband, stabbed him and uh, she is an Aboriginal woman um, and the trial was held in Carnarvon on the 23rd of October 1989 and she was, found, she was charged with willful murder, I think, and uh, she was convicted of manslaughter. Now, this is in the days before um, you were allowed to defend yourself against non-eminent harmful acts. This was in the days before we heard about battered women's syndrome and before all the publicity that we've heard these days about you know, the number of women who are killed around the place every year in Australia and around the world and about why women stay and why they don't leave and why when they leave they come back and why they're in danger when they leave and all these sorts of things which now we are hearing about. This was back before then. So I had a woman as my client in 1989, 30 years ago, that, we, that I had to defend. And I had a barrister who was advising me. I was the counsel, but he was helping me out, Ian Marshall. And, and we together worked on a strategy. So what I did was I got all her hospital records and it was a horror story because she had been admitted to hospital on so many occasions with injuries and serious injuries at the hands of the deceased man who was her partner. And we were able to present that to the jury. And in <coughs> Carnarvon, it wasn't as though people were completely oblivious to the uh, violence that was perpetrated by men on women because on occasions they saw it in the street in this small place. So it was, I was able to show the uh, jurors um, her history and they understood, although not to the extent that uh, unfolded uh, initially because we needed the uh, medical reports. And she gave evidence and she was very, and interestingly, I saw her just recently. Um, I was counsel in Carnarvon and she was on the jury panel. <laughs> so I had to slip a note to the prosecutor and I said, uh, juror number 30, whatever it was, one, I think I represented, she changed a lot, so have I. Um, I think I represented her for murder in 1989. Um, needless to say, she was challenged, but she left a message that she wanted to see me. So I ran into her down at the shopping centre in Carnarvon and I said, you know, uh, Jenny, your case was before all this battered women's syndrome and all that stuff these days that we know about. And uh, she said, George, you did all that. You 
got those hospital records and I thank you for that. Now she was sentenced, Jenny Dingo, was sentenced to three years imprisonment by uh, Justice Walsh and with a minimum of one year, 11 months. So she basically walk, walked out of the court because she'd spent some time in, in uh, prison already. Now, the judge had a good uh, idea of what she'd been through. Then, in 1993, so that's about, what, four years later, I represented Mavis Veronica Gilbert. She killed her husband in Mullawar. She was a full-blood Aboriginal lady over in Mullawar, and she um, stabbed him and he died. And uh, I read um, a paper on um, representing women who are charged with homicide and domestic violence situations, and it was by Julie Stubbs and Julia Tolmy, Professor um, Julia Tolmy here. So I made contact with Julia, and I must have driven her mad because um, I just uh, used her up a lot, uh, getting all her information, um, trying to understand all this stuff, and it was pretty new to me, uh, all this uh, this, um, these ideas about um, women not doing the things you'd expect them to do in these situations, like leave and get help. And it opened my eyes a lot, and um, this was the time of the battered women syndrome, was the flavour of the month. So I said to Julia, look, what about this battered, you know, battered women? Julia wasn't a fan of this at all, because she made the point, why should we be looking upon the victim as having some sort of syndrome and something wrong with her psychiatrically and a bit of a nutcase. So I listened to her, but in the end, I decided to go down that path um, because I wanted to give my client the best chance and uh, I knew that this was not a defence, but it was evidence that was allowed in court and would help the jury to understand why she behaved like she did according to this syndrome, which says, you know, women become helpless and um, uh, snap, basically. And um, I'm not a fan of it anymore either. <laughs> but what I did was I had a parallel attack to the jury and said, you might think, members of the jury, that you don't need some expert to come along here and tell you why she acted like this. It's there. But you might think you don't need that because there's enough information there which explains it objectively. And this all came from talking with Julia, you see. And I said, she's been battered for all these years, she's been to hospital and blah, blah, blah. And we put it on two bases. So still she was convicted of manslaughter, even with the battered woman syndrome. Um, with Mavis Veronica Gilbert, I called Eric Papertalk, who was an elder, an old man from Mullawar, to give evidence. And he said, when he was trying to explain why the Aboriginal women in, that, in this particular instance stay with their partners when they've been so badly treated. And he said, historically, in Aboriginal law, Aboriginal men were allowed to physically chastise their wife and he told us what in what circumstances but if they were excessive they were very severely dealt with even killed by the um, people in the community he said this is all broken down because nobody respects the law anymore but that original idea is permeated still down in the culture but the Protective measures are gone because of alcohol and because of lack of contact with the original real uh, culture and law. He was a very impressive um, witness. Still, uh, she was convicted of manslaughter and Justice Scott was the presiding judge. And you know what he said to her, on the Friday she was found guilty, on the Monday, he said, Ms Gilbert, go home to your children. And he, he put her on probation. So she walked out of the court. So 
All, and then I represented Narelle Wally. She killed her man. Now, she was, she was charged with willful murder. She was so worried about being convicted of willful murder or murder and doing, getting life imprisonment or a lengthy, very long term that she instructed me, after giving her her options, to offer a plea of manslaughter. Now, in Charmory Lenagay's case, the prosecution made it very clear at the outset that they were not interested at all in a plea to manslaughter. And yet the sentencing judge still said, well, she didn't offer it. Still, she didn't offer it. Although, as though that was a bad thing, even though the prosecution had said, I said, well, why should she offer it when they said it's not available? It doesn't make sense. And that um, was referred to in the Court of Appeal as well. Narelle Wally offered a plea of guilty to manslaughter and I said to the DPP or the Crown Law, I think it was at the time, and I told them about Jenny Dingo and Mavis Gilbert and they haven't been successful there and they're not going to be successful here and, uh, in terms of uh, aiming for the sky to get to the trees or aiming to, for the trees to get to the sky. So they accepted the plea of guilty to manslaughter. And uh, Justice McKechnie, he heard it all and heard the plea of mitigation and she was there and he sentenced her to one year, eight months imprisonment. So she also was a free woman, but the state appealed against the sentence and her sentence was increased to three years. Now, we come to Charmory Lenagai. Charmory, um, I, um, I have many, many, many conversations with uh, Professor Stella Turan, who was absolutely magnificent in helping me in this case and getting my mind around the law of self-defence, which wasn't... I said to Tony Templeman, why is the law so complicated? Why are the law... Why is the law so complex? He said, well, because it's about human behaviour. And human behaviour is complicated, George. But I still think it's too complex. This idea that about a reasonable response is a difficult one to get your mind around. Chamery's case, the jury <coughs> decided, there's no doubt about it, that she reasonably believed. She had reasonable grounds to believe and this was accepted, that she had to do what she did in order to um, save herself from a harmful act. But as the judge said to her in the sentencing, you went too far. Well, what was she supposed to do apart from what she did? If she's already been decided, if it's already been decided that she believed reasonably that she had to do what she did, the next step is, is, is uh, it, well, it's very difficult to understand, which is why when we frame the appeal to the High Court, one of the grounds of appeal on Stella's suggestion was that this verdict was not open. Now, Charmory just didn't want to go through another trial. It was a horrendous experience being cross-examined and sitting through the whole trial. She'd spoken to the police at length, given interviews. She'd spoken to two psychiatrists at length. She'd spoken to um, Victoria Cook, who uh, was the, uh, so the social worker. And uh, so she'd been through it all so many times and given evidence and was cross-examined. And she said, George, I can't handle this anymore. I instruct you to withdraw the appeal to the High Court which is what we did. Now, in Charmory's case, I tried to call evidence from Victoria, who's here today, and she's a social worker. I looked for psychologists and psychiatrists, and I couldn't find any, really, I couldn't find any who had an expertise in this area of domestic violence. There was, they had expertise in battered women's syndrome, which I didn't want to touch with a bar of soap this time. So, in the end, I decided I'd try for a social worker. 
And Victoria Cook has a degree in social work and vast experience in the area of um, domestic violence. But her evidence was said to be inadmissible. One of the reasons is because the judge said, this is common knowledge, all this stuff about why women don't leave, when they leave, they're in danger, when they come back, why they come back, all these sorts of questions as to why they behave in the way that you don't expect they should behave is well within the juror's knowledge. After getting that decision in the Supreme Court down here, I walked out of court, jumped in a taxi to go to the airport to fly back to Geraldton. The taxi driver said, what do you do for a living as usual? And I tell him, what are you doing down here? I told him about the case. You know what he said? Why didn't she just walk out? Why didn't she leave? I couldn't believe it. I felt, I, I felt like telling him to turn around and come back and we'll call him as a witness. <laughs> so, um, and then, um, you know, what is it about all this? I, I, I was in, um, uh, in Italy at a conference and an ex-High Court judge, when I was telling him about this case, said to me, George, we can't have these women going around killing their husbands. And when I tell men that, they think it's really funny. They laugh. <laughs> but um, the women don't at all. The, the law of self-defence, what, what happens is the judges, when they direct the juries on it, use words that are not in the criminal code, you know, like partial self-defence, like excessive self-defence, or um, excessive force, or disproportionate force, all these sorts of things, when they're trying to explain whether the reaction was reasonable or not. And that was one of my points. You know, why use these words that are not in there? Why not just use the words of the section of the criminal code, which, um, which uh, are clear? The other thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and I'll get to why I'm saying all this in a minute, but um, one of the other thing is this duty to retreat. Now, if two men are having a fight outside a pub, you know, I had a case where two blokes were having a fight outside the hotel in Carnarvon, so I just stood up and said to the jury, well, you can see what's happened here, members of the jury. They've charged the winner of the fight. Not guilty. The woman is not in that situation. She, the, and there's no, and the judge had to tell the jury he's allowed to fight. In other words, he's not under a duty to retreat. A man's allowed to stand up and fight. He doesn't have to run away. But the woman's got to, doesn't she? She's got to leave. She shouldn't be there putting up with this. That's the way it works. So I said to the judge, could you direct the jury in this case that Ms Leanna Gay was not under a duty to retreat? Um, that was not, uh, that was unheard of. She's not under attack. She's not being, uh, mind you, she has no memory of what occurred. We don't know what was going on at the time, but um, on the uh, case as it came about, um, she um, is, there's no evidence that she was under attack, except there was an, a little camera that was in the corner of the room that was damaged, um, but that's another story. And it might have been that that was thrown at some stage. <coughs> but um, she was not under attack, so, you know, there's no duty to retreat. And when we went to the Court of Appeal, the judges said the same thing. They said, this applies when, you know, people are in a fight. Like two men in a fist fight. They didn't say men, but two people fighting. Then there's no duty. But there is no law about... But I was asking them to make the law, say it that it applies in the case of a non-imminent, uh, defending yourself against a non-imminent um, uh, harm. And, of course, the judge had told the jurors, you're entitled to look at her, whether she had other options, apart from what she did, whether she believed she had other options, and whether she could take steps 
other than doing what she did to protect herself or um, the young girl. He's telling the jury this. So the next step should be, surely, but she's not under a duty to do these things. Just like the man fighting is not under a duty to retreat. To me, that's logical. And when the prosecutor says to the jury, and this is, I'm not criticising anybody, but when the, because the criticism of me too in this case, I prob could have done more. But the, and you can always learn as you go along. Even when I win a case, I always say, what could I have done better? But the uh, prosecutor said to the jury, straight out, members of the jury, she could have just walked out the door. As simple as that. Which, of course, just is completely at odds with the sort of evidence that I was trying to call from the psychologist to say. And when I tried to do that, the judge says, this is common knowledge, you know, about women staying, not leaving, all this sort of thing. Um, so not long ago, I was counsel in another case for a lady who was charged with, I think it was... Um, unlawful wounding or grievous bodily harm, something like that. And um, she and we, uh, she was found not guilty. And I um, was saying to the jury, members of the jury, mem women all over the world stay in these relationships, and they are killed all the time in Australia. One every two weeks, the judge says, stop me in my address. Mr Judici, there's no evidence of this. <laughs> Common knowledge, Your Honour. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't let me go down that path any more. So we're caught, you know, between the devil and the deep blue sea there. What's the point of all this I'm trying to make here? The point I'm trying to make is... Nothing's changed. Charmery Lena Gay had the advantage of the law being changed to allow women to take action against a non-imminent harm. Still manslaughter. Psychologists, battered women syndrome, tried that one. Still manslaughter. And I'll leave you with this thought. When the sentencing occurred, I was telling the judge uh, about uh, this statistic that one woman in Australia every uh, two weeks is killed by um, their partner or husband. He said, and men get killed in domestic violence uh, circumstances, Mr Judici, they're not just perpetrators, sometimes are victims of domestic violence. And I said, yes, Your Honour, but nowhere near the number of women. He said, yes, or no, but it's sometimes unuseful to generalise. <laughs> now, my point is this. I believe there is a big difference between men in situations where they're abused in relationships and women for lots of reasons. And I won't go into them, in case I get into trouble. <laughs> Stella tells me there's no difference between men and women. Thank you.